and welcome back to the Middling Along podcast. I'm your host, Emma Thomas, and joining me today is Leela Ainge. Leela is an accredited psychologist with 20 years of cross-industry business consulting experience. Her psychology research helps us to understand how entrepreneurs experience imposter phenomenon. She's also the host of the Psychologically Speaking podcast, which is currently delving deep into imposter phenomenon. And that's going to be the main topic of what we're going to talk about today. So welcome along, Leela. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Emma. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Let's start then by delving into that terminology. Mm. Why do you prefer to talk about imposter phenomenon or imposter feelings rather than imposter syndrome, which is probably the term that most of us are much more familiar with? Can you un- explain the sort of the difference and the preference? And I mean, fundamentally, an, a syndrome, it kind of suggests that something is a medical condition that mm. an individual has. When we start to look at some of the experiences that people have around feelings of fraudulence, feeling like they might get found out, all of these typical narratives that we associate with imposter, we know that there's more to it than just the individual. We know it's not just down to the individual. It's not just the individual that needs to build on their confidence. And the reason we know this is because successful women who are CEOs, who are innovators and entrepreneurs have managed to do the things they've done despite feeling and experiencing those things so you have to question then is it a syndrome is it just about the woman or the man or is this a phenomenon and and the phenomenon fits better because there's a lot of it that's unexplained So my podcast really delves into the research that I did because I went and said, well, I want to know what it is that women experience. But the question I had was in a very specific context. It was, what do they experience when they're in online spaces with other women and competition? And the results were just really interesting because it helps us to understand that there is more to this than just the individual. So I would argue quite strongly that we should stop using the term syndrome. It pathologizes it. It puts the onus back on the individual. And I think it kind of lets a lot of things and people off the hook. So it kind of says to platform providers, oh, don't worry, you don't need to do anything because that's on the woman or the man that has those feelings. Or perhaps in a workplace situation, it puts managers off the hook because it says, don't worry about psychological safety. (laughs) This is their confidence. And, you know, that feels like gaslighting. (laughs) It it is something that does seem to have become much more associated with women. Mm. Um, And I don't know how true that is. I mean, obviously, I think a lot of men do also suffer from if you inverted commas can you suffer from a phenomenon experience experience this but we hear so much more about it being experienced by women yeah and I think you know here we go back to the history so in episode one of my um, podcast I go back and say well where did the origins of imposter come from and the two psychologists who coined the term imposter phenomenon We're actually seeing women who were highly educated and um, who who felt like they were going to get found out as frauds. So the origin of this phenomenon was absolutely rooted in the experiences of women who were at the time working in a world that was not designed for them. We're talking about 1978, you know, Um, that was 46 years ago, you know, a long, long time. And 46 years ago, there were plenty of workplaces that didn't even have toilets for women. I've worked in print factories in the late 80s, early 90s, where, you know, the world of work just wasn't set up for women. That's astounding, isn't it? To think, you know, in in our own lifetimes, how different... But to come back to how many people and and what that representation looks like, nobody knows. So there's this figure um, that is banded around on the internet and in books, up to 70% of men and women or or women will experience imposter phenomenon. And, you know, I was absolutely determined to kind of track down where did that percentage come from? And this is quoted in quite a lot of academic literature. So I thought yeah, self perpetuates. There must, must have been a study. And what I am discovering, I think, <laughs> is that it only has to be written once for it to snowball. And this wasn't written as a result of an, a study. 
academic or otherwise. This was written in a review paper in an educational supplement back in the in the 70s, or I think it was early 80s, actually. And somebody just said, you know, just latched onto it. Yeah, and, and now it's true. Really uses this. Yeah. So I, I think it's helpful to kind of say we just don't know. But what we do know is that it is a term that is empathic. People get it. Mm. People can go either I have experienced that or I can imagine that you might have experienced it. And that for me makes it just sticky and prevalent. It would um I mean definitely in in sort of past lives where I've been um sort of running women's network. Mm. within a corporate setting we've had external people come in and talk about imposter syndrome would you like to see more of those kinds of environments flipping that that language and using imposter phenomenon yeah and this this is the whole point behind my research and and the reason that I've gone to um, release it as a podcast rather than an academic journal first is that I want people to hear that this isn't just about you Mm. and actually you're probably not the problem (laughs) you You are not broken you heard it here first no no, we aren't broken you know we're we're human we're social and we're human and we're living in some phenomenally brilliant times where we have all of these technology advances things are different the way I go to work is absolutely different to the way generations before me went to work if you are a woman that is different again um, and then when we start to layer on intersections it is different and different and different again so I think yes imposter phenomenon research has definitely blossomed but I think it's now time for us to kind of go okay so now that we know that we all agree that we all experience this thing let's start thinking about why we experience it what are the contexts and and where which environments promote it versus which environments reduce or eliminate those feelings Hmm. and as someone who studies this or has studied this quite extensively how do you personally kind of approach and interrogate your own imposter feelings when they come up? This is really interesting. So if you had, if we were having this conversation seven or eight years ago, I'm not sure I would have really empathised with imposter in the same way that I do now. And something significant has happened in that time or two significant life events. One, I've had a child, and then I transitioned from having a toddler into perimenopause. And so those life events have had a a deep impact on me and my experiences. The first one being a mother um, of a child who, things happened. I mean, he was in NICU when he first was born and and we were both a little bit poorly, you know, Mm. and my experiences weren't the experiences of my direct family. And the group of friends I had at the time through my NCT group hadn't experienced what I'd experienced. And that was the first kind of inkling I ever had around, am I doing this right? I I don't feel like I'm doing this in the same way as everybody else. I feel like I'm a bit of a fraud as a mum. I don't think I know what I'm doing. And actually being in that context of visiting my own child in a NICU ward around all of these phenomenal professionals and feeling out of my depth and not knowing that I knew how to be the natural mother Mm. (laughs) that you told you You, you're almost told that when you have a child don't worry about it you'll just know you'll just know (laughs) you don't you don't just know I mean you do need a rule book Although I would say, uh, having read so many books with my first child, I, I think there is no such help. thing as too many books. <laughs> <laughs> but but that was the first inkling for me of, of feeling like an imposter. The second one came a number of years later with a wave of anxiety. And for the first time in my adult life, I experienced anxiety at a point in my career where um, it, it became crippling. It, it was really severe for me and I didn't understand what was going on. Here I am, somebody who's always been very confident. And just to give more context, I have been a a consultant or a a business consultant for such a long time. I am so used to being the one person in the room who doesn't know the business very well, because I will go in somewhere and say, I don't know anything, but what I do know is how to organise a team, organise a process, and I can give you good practice but I don't know the details. So you get very comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
to suddenly in my 40s start to feel waves of anxiety about not knowing stuff um, felt quite alien to me. And it took a long time for me to realise that actually that was the start of perimenopause for me. Mm. So when you say, how do I, how do I support myself? Part of it has been recognising why I have experienced it at that time and why that experience happened. Both were very contextual for me. And this is why I've researched it as a psychologist, because, you know, for me, it just felt like there is more to this than just an individual. I didn't change overnight, but my situation changed. Mm, different sort of mm. flavors depending on what's going on for for an individual or yeah. kind of what kind of environment they're finding themselves in and I think that lends itself into then what do we do when that happens and I think the best thing you can do is not to think of yourself as having a syndrome <laughs> the best thing you can do is to interrogate your surroundings and go who am I around at the moment where am I at the moment what's changed what's different and what is this environment giving me or not giving me? And so they're the things that I try to centre myself around. And that's just good advice, I think, in life, you know. Yeah. So really trying to sort of interrogate a bit more, maybe having a little bit of sort of detachment and rather than yeah. kind of beating yourself up for feeling that way, trying to go kind of a bit deeper and and, mm. and figure out, you know, what might be creating those feelings and and yeah as you say what what's what's different why am I suddenly feeling this now what else is going on for me you know I I think it is very easy with the narrative around imposter phenomenon to to think I will always feel this way I will always have that experience I I think when I did the research and spoke to all of the entrepreneurs I spoke to it was very obvious that it's a very um easy come easy go feeling because we experience bouts of imposter at different times. And when we really talked about it being such a, a kind of moving feast, an energetic thing, that words like whoosh and waterfall, it's not like a, a, a hose pipe that is just running water all of the time. It's something that comes and goes. So I think at that point, when, when we feel a rush of something that we think, oh, God, you know, am I good enough or this or that or the other it's just stepping back a little bit and going okay well what was the situation here and and, and what is the context as you were saying your your research focused very much on online spaces it did yeah do you think that the the sort of the amount of time that many of us spend in online spaces different kinds of online spaces which has mushroomed hugely over the last 10 20 years does that have a direct bearing do you think on our likelihood of experiencing imposter phenomenon that whole kind of you know we're constantly comparing ourselves to to kind of other people to peers to you know to people we don't even know to people we've never even shared a room with <laughs> undoubtedly it's a factor there's a really interesting way of thinking about this and I'm going to give us the example of comparison because comparison is the one thing that we know shows up psychologically in online spaces and it shows up through something called context collapse so this is the idea that and I'm going to use Twitter as an example or X or whatever it's called um, no one knows what to call it anymore it's hilarious yeah. <laughs> it was definitely a verb to tweet but if you think about Twitter, for example, one of the most wonderful things about that platform, certainly, you know, in its early days, was the fact that you could connect with authors, you could connect with TV stars, you could connect with um, people you wouldn't ordinarily connect with. You're in a digital space with a plumber down the road, an author up, up the street. It, it created a level playing field, if you like, mm. for people to converse. But what that leads to is a meshing and a flattening of audiences. So this is what we're now describing as a, a context collapse, a, a complete collapse of context. And with that, that comparison is different to what we've always experienced. Now, comparison is absolutely nothing new. So if you think about, there's one social scientist, Festinger, who in 1954, he was the one who described social comparison. Social comparison has been around for a long, long time. And it's the way that we evaluate ourselves. So 
the word evaluate and comparison feel very strange, don't they? Because they're they're almost doing the same thing, but they have different connotations. An evaluation from a business perspective would be like, I'm going to evaluate where I'm at and see if I'm high or low. An evaluation, if I'm a student, is am I passing or failing? A comparison can mean, oh, am I weighing something up? You know, is this apples or oranges? But a comparison, as we know it in online spaces, can feel, am I good enough? So the this social comparison is such a complex kind of issue, but it isn't something new. The new thing is, I suppose, just the speed at which technology has arrived, not just that it's been done to us, but the fact that we've adopted it so quickly. and We've adopted it without a second thought. So if you think about I was thinking about this the other day, actually, how my child who's eight has adopted technology without a rule book. He has adopted technology without being taught and technology is designed in that way, which is really brilliant. But the downside of that is we're not being passed down any lived experience of when you use this type of technology, here are things you can do to make sure you get the best out of it. Here's things you can do to support yourself. And I was thinking back to one of my first ever roles as a graduate and somebody took me under their wing. So this woman had uh, kind of eased me into corporate life and was telling me a little bit about how the way we do things around here, what we call culture. And without that, I think I'd have found it quite difficult to navigate around the workplace. And yet we think that we can just navigate our way around an online workspace or spaces without that guidance. So this social comparison that happens is just a different way in which social comparison happens in online spaces but it's nothing new as humans we've always been that social person who has weighed ourselves up who's compared ourselves with you know in countries where you have a class system um in the uk upper class lower class middle class you know we've always done this comparison but the way in which it is so kind of concentrated and flattened and meshed for us i think that's what causes the the challenge Mm. And also just the scale of it, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it was in the interview um, like I did with Tanith Carey, who was talking about the, um, you know, the fact that you can interact with the same number of people in online in a yeah. day as your sort of prehistoric ancestors would ever have met in their lifetime. <laughs> which I kind of, I, I don't know why I'd never really thought about it like that before. And mm-hmm. it's like that, that's astounding that our our brains still kind of playing catch up with just this sort of not just the sort of the the overwhelm of the sheer amount of information that we're exposed to which is anyway Mm. totally overwhelming and daunting but actually that just the number of other individuals that we're interacting with trying to figure out those kind of those relationships and and those relationship dynamics constantly it it seems really interesting to me, and it's a really good point you make because that whole thing about us being super social, we are just super social, but that super socialness has always come with the the grounding of objectiveness because I don't know, <laughs> growing up, I mean, you're told phrases like don't get too big for your boots or, you know, um, who gave you that idea, you know. And these are like kind of fam- family phrases that families would use to to ground you, to, ob- to keep you objectively placed within your space in the world. And yet in the online space, again, some of those, those kind of um, structures aren't there for us because they don't exist. So when we go back to social comparison the definition of it is you know there is this evaluation but the negative aspect of comparison is when there's no objective um objectiveness there and that's what causes the the discomfort really because we're not objectively able to go yeah maybe I shouldn't be comparing myself to somebody who lives in the United Arab Emirates and (laughs) doesn't have children (laughs) You know, so we've all done it. There are people online where you think, wow, God, they're amazing. And then you might think, oh, should I be like this? Should I be like that? 
But we're only seeing half the story as well, aren't we? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we, we see a lot of that. There was a really interesting article at the end of last year, end of 2023. And this group of researchers were using what I would call traditional measures of imposter. So they were measures that are very much um, looking at how it makes the individual feel. So I'm, I've got a fear of failure. I, I feel like I'm not good enough, that kind of thing. Mm. But nevertheless, their research was focused on LinkedIn and they were interested in what happens when we have this like kind of evergreen feed of information and how we compare ourselves and, and what happens as a result of it. Despite those feelings, we might go, leave the situation with thinking, oh, God, you know, that person's brilliant or I like the way they do that or I disagree with what they're saying. They're saying that it really impacts the way we consume stuff. And I was really intrigued by this idea because apparently if we see something on LinkedIn and we do that appraisal or evaluation and decide that we are not as good as that person we've just seen, it will drive a consumption to go and buy training to bring ourselves up to that level. So you can see how some of these psychological processes are starting to take place. And that's why with the research that I've done, I've kind of gone, take yourself back to the context. Where's that person? Where are you? Is your appraisal, you know, objective here? <laughs> and also, do you need to be what they're doing? You know, is that something you actually wanted want to do to, before yeah. you saw them this morning? <laughs> and I'm sure that's how a lot of things get sold in online spaces. Oh, see this shiny thing that I've done or I have, I've been able to achieve this with my sales or I've been able to sell this product. And we might think, oh, should I be doing that? So I, th I think there's very much that kind of keeping up appearances that comes in as well. Yeah, I've got a couple of friends who who just don't do social media at all, mm. um, and, I, and I must say I'm a tiny bit envious of, of all that <laughs> extra headspace that, that they must have for day to day, <laughs> not being drawn in constantly, sort of sucked back in, refreshing. I think it's interesting how people feel about it as well. So this was something that came through quite clearly in, in the interviews that I did with women. So most of the women I'd spoken to had, were, had been running their businesses for more than seven years. They were very established, hugely successful women. And some of them were using online spaces in a very needs must way, you know, and they'd drawn up their own boundaries around mm. what they wanted to use. I think what's interesting in the research is how women use avoidance as a coping mechanism so often and um, to avoid very vast spaces where we get a lot of context collapse, a lot of what you're describing as noise and extra thought. They're putting themselves into communities because communities are then a, a snapshot or a smaller digital room within the whole internet. So more controllable. Yeah. And, and they're basically saying, well, I'll dip in on this day or I'll turn up for that online event and I'll engage once a week. There was one person who said, I go in on a Tuesday and a Thursday, answer any questions that people have, have raised, might pop in my own thought, but I just don't go in every day. And so I, I think this is what I'm saying in terms of our adoption of technology has been so quick that perhaps some of this wisdom that we have within ourselves um, hasn't had time to percolate and pass through yet and will it ever because technology keeps changing so quickly mm. yeah that's an interesting one yeah I think that sort of we don't tend to uh, or certainly I can only speak for myself to kind of be that thoughtful about like you say joining a kind of an online space mm. and then kind of almost self-policing yeah it, and, um, and also because the way that they're built right they're constantly sort of trying to suck you back in mm. and send you notifications or kind of here's a digest of everything that happened today or <laughs> whatever but yeah I guess just that sort of that notion that, that you you know you do you can rest back that control but mm. you kind of have to first you have to kind of think about it and, and be mindful and go okay well maybe this will work out better for me if if I put down some kind of ground rules about how I'm going to engage with this and then and then actually have a bit of willpower to stick to it. I think this is where the research kind of moves into to the, the kind of phase of, so what does all of this mean? And a lot of this for me meant that, you know, no, you're not to blame. You're, you're not at fault here. 
actually, I think our platform providers need to think, you know, very clearly about the type of digital, what we call affordances they give us. And if I pick LinkedIn as an example, it's the one professional platform out there that you'd think that we'd have a little bit of control over as as a user. Yeah, if I post onto LinkedIn, there's very little I can do to restrict who can see that post and how they can respond. If you compare or contrast that to something like Instagram, Instagram actually has more digital affordances that protect my privacy and also protect my boundaries. And I think that's really interesting that one's a professional tool and lauded for being more sensible. You know? yeah. And then the other one's seen as a showboating platform where people aren't really authentic. And I think perhaps what is more authentic is a space where we can be ourselves and put our, our boundaries in place. But a lot of this speaks to, I suppose, the what we call the dark side of being online and being social and as a cyber psychologist I truly believe that we're just social people and the way that we behave online is an extension of our real lives and so what the research also found is despite all of this stuff that we have to navigate and deal with being online and and being able to compare is a really positive thing for women in business yeah. because it helps them get ahead. And it was really surprising. This, this was the, I didn't expect to get this as part of the research. I think my assumptions heading into the research, although you're not supposed to have assumptions if my... <laughs> Sorry, I won't tell anyone. Listening here. <laughs> <laughs> but my assumptions were that women would feel that being online was, was quite negative, actually, and there were a few positives other than, you know, network. And I thought that the main positive of being in an online space would be growing your network and growing potential customers and getting sales. Mm. The theme that came out the most was this theme of there is no comparison. And what that meant was in some online spaces where you were able to be more authentic, um, you were also able to take part quite silently, that you didn't feel that there was a pressure to show up because it wasn't about that. It was a, almost like a refuge from your online persona. <laughs> yeah. But whilst taking part silently, you could learn from what other people were saying. So you got that behind the scenes objective appraisal. Other women were giving you objectivity and saying, yeah. I I only made 10 sales last month or yeah I found this really difficult and if you follow that same person online and you see their public facing profile you might be able to go oh I can objectively appraise that what I see isn't what they're going through and that has helped me to one feel more objectively that I can evaluate where I am in comparison to that person that's really important because we all socially compare but actually it's helpful because I know I won't make that mistake because I've learned from somebody else or actually I think I can do that in a different way. So that that was the really powerful thing that came out for me was just how women have taken something that's so ambiguous as an online space such as the internet have gone I'm going to find pockets where I can belong and then when I'm in that pocket or that digital room I'm going to use comparison to my advantage. And and what's t- t- tell us a bit more about the you're doing more research now you're you're actually yes. doing a PhD so what's yeah. what's that going to be about? So I was really interested in what's the point what you know why why should we be online? I mean to speak to your friends who have disengaged from digital you know it it's why should we be online? What what do we get from it? And I think it's really hard to answer that question at the moment because you say to somebody, can you give a return on investment for the hours that you spend on the internet? Or can you give a return on investment for the number of posts that you put up? I think it's hard for us to quantify what have we gained from being in social networks. So my research is looking at how do we measure what we call social capital? So what we gain from being on on, online spaces and attached to that the psychology bit is really thinking does our mindset influence that as well so what attitude do we go in with and how does that impact how we feel about our connections and our ability to make connections and then once we've made those connections have we got something back from it is it reciprocal or is it not under what circumstances so 
yeah, we're still kind of working on <laughs> how I'm going to test those ideas, and that hypothesis, but that, that's essentially where the research is, is, is moving into. And how does it feel starting a, a PhD kind of in, in sort of later in <laughs> later in career? We say. I think this is the really in, a really interesting thing. I think for a long, long time, I went to university and did a very practical HND, which taught me how to write a web page. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> back in the day when you probably had yeah. to write. And then my early career was very much around, you know, computer support and application support, that kind of thing. And then I moved into consultancy and change. So when I went back to university, obviously about six, seven years ago. I was really nervous about studying. I didn't think I was academic. Mm. And to some respect, I think a PhD is really interesting because the traditional way of doing a PhD has to be quite, you get your nose down, you do your research and you publish this massive old manual or 80,000 words. (laughs) And I'm such a slow writer. (laughs) And I don't have a massive vocabulary that that isn't what I'm in it for. I think what I'm in it for is because education's changed so much and the fact that it's all about having an application to your research. So for me, it's around how do I help people who are in online spaces to understand the value they get from something? So yeah, in terms of returning, it's very much, I'm trying to see it as a, as a work assignment that I'm trying to solve a problem and, and get there. I'm not so sure I'm that comfortable with the the whole being an academic <laughs> yet. <laughs> it's definitely an un- it's it's an unusual and uncomfortable kind of title at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people feel like that at the start of their PhD journeys. <laughs> yeah. Well, an, a, another layer of uh, imposter phenomenon to unpack <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that that sound, that feels like a good place to kind of a nice neat kind of bookend to uh, to finish on. Leila, thank you so much for coming and uh, talking to us today. If people want to find you in various online spaces, where can they look for you? Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn as Leela Ainge. And psychologically speaking, the podcast is on all of the usual platforms. Great stuff. We'll put some links in the show notes. And uh, yeah, I'm look, looking forward to catching the next episode of your podcast very soon. Oh, thank you, Emma. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you. Thanks for having me on. You've been listening to the Middling Along podcast. Do remember to subscribe to be notified when our next episode is live. And why not visit the blog at www.middlingalong.com to sign up to my newsletter as well. I do hope you enjoyed listening today. If you did, I'd be really grateful if you would consider leaving a short review as that helps people find the podcast and helps get it noticed. Hope you can join us next time. Goodbye for now.